This is Jordan from Them Evils, and you're listening to Cobras and Fire, and Rock is Not Dead. Right on. Well, uh, Jordan, of course, thanks for coming back on the program. It's been a while since we've talked. Uh, actually, the last time um, the last time you and I talked, you were playing in St. Paul, Minnesota at the Turf Club. Uh, now, it's kind of a cool venue, but I'm not sure how memorable these 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 places are for you. Uh, do you recall that that place? It's kind of an old, kind of got a very 50s decor to it. You, you guys, the, the dressing room that you were in was down in the basement? Was that the place? It's very small, and the, the stage is in the corner, and it's like a circular stage. No, it's it, it is a small stage, but it's square. It's it's like you know what I mean. You, you've been in a lot of these places, but you know, I'll tell you what. The reason I bring it up is because a buddy of mine saw you in Colorado a couple months prior to that, and he happened to be in town, and I was already going to your show, so he he came with me. Um, and he the drunker he got, the more he wanted because he talked to you at the, at the Colorado show, uh, you and uh, the other guys. And the drunker he got, the more fired up he got to talk to you again to see if you remembered him. And he now you would only remember him because of his back. He has a giant kiss tattoo, uh, and he sat patiently waiting, you know, pretty hammered, uh, while you talked to a couple other people. And then he pulled off his shirt and showed it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Okay, well, his we gr- must have been. We must have all been on a pretty good one. Yeah, I think uh, he was drunker than you guys. Uh, <laughs> but hey, it was a great show. Whatever it was, I think it was Memorial Weekend, 2018. Is the last time I last time I actually saw you guys play too. So okay, um, yeah, that's been a long time. That's been four years. Yeah, you know what? And, um, God, you were doing what were you? What tour were you guys on right before the the lockdown hit on? I thought I had a, a show that I was going to go see you guys on, but I can't. I'm drawing a blank. Do you even remember? I don't remember. The last tour I remember doing was. Um, was it Pop Evil? It might have been. It had to have been Pop Evil. Okay. Yeah, it ended up you getting canceled because of everything. Club, I know exactly what you're thinking now, now that you said old 50s. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah, wife and Pop I. Pop Evil was our, our last big tour. Okay. This was that you guys were headlining this show at Turf Club, though. Oh, we were. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. They all blend together. Uh, yeah, every absolutely. day and every venue, they uh, it's just like, <laughs> yeah, I think I've been there. Show me pictures. Yeah, right on. No, I, uh, if I had some handy, I'd whip them up here. But uh, I, I did run into you guys a couple <laughs> months later uh, in Wisconsin at Northern Invasion. Actually, I only saw Jake. I didn't know you guys were there at all until. Well, he was running around in like a hard to miss outfit though. Like uh it was like an American flag cut into shorts and a shirt. Um I don't but I think I think what I found out later is you guys were playing something in uh, like a Zippo side stage the VIP deal they had going there. Does that sound familiar? Yes, we played that. We played that and I think we played this the uh, the main stage as well. Okay. Uh but yeah, anyway, it, it's all I'm just, I'm I don't even know why I'm bringing this up. It's almost like Chris Farley like that was great, man. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's a lot going on. I'd like to just, uh, get into with you. The first question I had prepped for you though, was when was the last time you slapped somebody? It's kind of topical right now. Oh man. I don't know when I slapped somebody, but I know I kicked the shit out of someone. Uh, we were in <laughs> Dallas, Texas. We just did, uh, four shows with the cherry bombs hmm. and some guy tried to walk on our bus all angry and he, he, he lunged at me and he, I was sitting on top of the stairs and I had the higher ground than yeah. him. So I Spartan kicked him right in the face <laughs> with my boot. And then I got on top of him and I was just like, like, what are you going to do, man? Like, don't, don't try to, you know, run on my bus. I'm going to kick your ass. And they got up, tried to start like pulling on my shirt. So I grabbed him by the hair and I would just beat the shit out of him. Well, that's a, uh, that's a little more vulgar than just a casual slap. You know what I mean? I know, yeah. but I don't think I've slapped anyone unless my fiance when she, you know, when I was, me. I mean, obviously I'm having a little fun with, with this, but I actually started thinking about it myself. I, I don't know, Jordan, I'm not sure I've ever slapped anybody. I honestly, I can't, I don't think it. I've slapped anybody either, <laughs> but maybe, maybe now going forward, it'll be, uh, you know, like more prevalent. You're like, maybe a slap's appropriate here instead of like a, a, yeah. a, a kick, but, uh, uh, did you ever Keep find my out- wife's name out of your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, what? Uh, did you ever find out why the guy was trying to get on your bus? What he was? Was he upset about something? Oh, he was just drunk and stoned and on whatever, and he was just acting like an idiot. So I had to put him in his place. All right. 
Well, moving on to something a little more organic. Uh, you, you've explained the story of how you guys got the name, but you haven't been on the show in a long time. We've got a lot of new listeners. Maybe they'd like to hear. Them Evils is a pretty cool name. Why don't you mind sharing the story again and how you guys got that? Yeah, of course. My mother was driving through Temecula, and she was texting someone, and she spelled Temecula wrong, and her phone auto-corrected it to Them Evils. Mm. And then she texted me. She was like, hey, bud. I got this really cool band name for you. And I go, what, mom? Like, you're like, okay, mom, whatever. And then she goes, them evils. And I go, that is the coolest name ever. And we changed our we changed our band name that day. Right on. Yeah, I've always been a big fan of the name. I, I dig it a lot. It is kind of goofy, kind of, but it rolls off the tongue good. And honestly, it kind of matches yeah. the vibe of the music, man. Yeah, appreciate that. Okay. It's a good name. Um, and, and just continuing to take you down the, the, the memory lane journey of, of, of our long, long <laughs> and, and tight friendship. I first met you guys. You were op- you were on tour with uh, Holy White Hounds and Pretty Reckless. Um, and I, it was one of the earlier interviews I had done for the podcast. And I remember while I was talking to you guys, somebody from the Holy White Hounds actually came on. And it was something about... I. I just remember White Claw being involved and there being like, I think you guys had swapped out their beers for White Claws or something like that. I don't know. They're you know, oh, like busting no, each other on we tour. Playing the ice game. Ice, that, so yes. We, yes. Yeah, so what we do is we'll put like random uh, Smirnoff ices and what they have to do is, <laughs> is when they randomly find it, they have to get on one knee and shrug the whole thing. Yeah, okay. All right. And we were just, we were messing with each other all tour. Yeah. No, those were, were, those, they were some fun guys. The, and great band. Um, that was my first time seeing both of you guys. Uh, was on that tour. Do you happen to stay in touch with either any, any anybody from them or? No, we talked to them a little bit on Instagram and social media, but we have we haven't played with them in years. Yeah, I mean they're Iowa, and you're what you're out in California, correct? Yeah. Do you know if are they still active? I, Sorry to make. Yeah, this I think Brent's keeping the band alive. I think they have new members, but um, Brent's definitely still doing it. All right. Um, I like to talk a little guitar nerd stuff with you because uh, I, I think you're a killer guitar player. Uh, y- y- you get great tone, first of all. But uh, the there is definitely something very kind of y- your your playing style kind of leans heavy on, on kind of classic hard rock riff heavy shit. And um, I guess, you know, to me that that kind of I, I hear a bit of Tony Iommi in what you do. I hear a lot of stuff, honestly, but is, is Black Sabbath was one of your influences? Or, like, let me just sum it up this way. Was there anybody that made you, like, get into guitar, like one player? Um, I would say the first guitar player that got me into guitar was Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day. Wow, that's surprising. And then, and then it evolved into James Hetfield and Kurt Hammett. They were my second favorite band. Um, and then I grew up literally playing Metallica albums all day, every day for eight hours a day until I knew every single note from Master Puppets, Ride the Lightning, Kill Em All, Injustice for All, um, and some of the Block album. But my guitar chops definitely came from playing metal, definitely. What about like singing? I could, I could, I could, I could still do like all the, the chugs and the mm-hmm. do 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 even though I play rock and roll, but when I'm when someone's like trying to get down and play some metal, I could do it. Yeah, I mean, you still go back. Do you ever whip out? I, you guys played an ACDC cover one time when I saw you. Um, do you ever do anything a little heavier, like what you're talking? Maybe Metallica, Slayer, or something like that. No, it's not really in our realm of music. We're more of a rock and roll band than we are a metal band, so we kind of yeah. stay away from that. Um, but you know, when we do do a cover, it's just like we try to do something timeless and classic, something everybody knows. Um, something that's easy to get into, something that the crowd will get pumped on. Cool. Um, you're also, I think you're a, a great singer. Uh, did you do de- something you developed, or was it pretty natural? Were you was your mom dragging you to church choir, like you know? No. Um, what happened was, we when Jake and I lived in Las Vegas, we had a singer, um, and he just wasn't as dedicated. He kind of helped. He kind of half-assed moved out here with us. Um, but we always kind of knew he wasn't the right guy. Uh, okay. We were looking for one on Craigslist through all the social media and through everyone that we knew in the music industry, and no one, no one would come up and sing. So I was like, you know what? I just got to do it myself. And then I just started singing the Alice in Chains records, um, Soundgarden records, ACDC records, 
Um, and that's kind of how I developed my, my, my voice. M- much like Hetfield, uh, basically kind of, nobody else was going to do it. So he did it. Yeah. I was like, I have to do this. I want to be in a band. I want to play shows. And the only way we're going to do that is if I just sack up and start singing. What age would you have started playing guitar then? I started playing guitar over, uh, oof. I was about 13 or 14. Okay. So I, yeah, it's like seventh grade. Uh, I assume you, you, your fingers are basically just a callus the whole time. I mean, uh, Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I started, oh, yeah. I started hard this, as a rock on the tip. <laughs> it, it doesn't go away. Uh, I, I don't even play yeah. as much as I used to. And, um, since I was 15 and basically the, the, the sense of feeling isn't as strong with these fingertips, but, uh, um, <laughs> you you have a lot of really cool guitars. At least when I've seen you, um, we actually have pretty similar tastes. How many guitars do you own? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, probably in the area of like seventeen to twenty. Wow. Yeah, I've got a few Gibsons. I've got some Zemitis. I got some um, like custom Strat and Tele builds. Um, I have got an Epiphone. I've got a few acoustics. Um, I've got an Ibanez and a few more that I couldn't <laughs> even tell you. Some I got a few under my bed, a few at the band room that I don't even know, mm-hmm. that I've totally forgotten about. But, I mean, my main ones, like, uh, oh, my Gibsons, they're in my room. I keep them safe. I don't really tour with those. Um, I have this really nice Gibson SG Custom Silver Sparkle with three pickups. My fiance actually bought it for me. Wow. She was like, if you if I buy this for you, you have to buy me a ring. She has a ring. <laughs> and uh <laughs> That's bullshit. <laughs> well, hey, if you're happy, I what do I know? I don't care. Oh, I'm extremely happy. I couldn't complain. I assume. Um But yeah, that's probably my favorite guitar. And then I have a few flying V's, uh Gibson Explorer. I actually sold a few of my Gibsons just to during COVID so I can pay the damn bills, unfortunately. But uh, you know, down the road down the road I'll just buy them back. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I just read, you mentioned a telly, uh, a little bit back. I, I, I got my first, I've never been a fender guy, but, uh, just through working with uh, a, a local guy from a band named flip here, I, I recently got a telecaster and you know, it, 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 at least it's for me, it has like a humbucker in it and stuff like that. But the neck on it is just, I'm like, what that, I was just wrong all this time. This, this thing plays amazing. Yeah. They're fast guitars, mm-hmm. huh? They're yeah. so fast. Like you could shred so hard on a telecaster. Like faster than you can on a on, on like a Les Paul or like yes. a Jackson that's made for metal. Like right. a Telecaster is where it's at. People, if you've never played a damn Telecaster, you got to play one. They they balance out nice too. They you know, they're, they look a they're, little different than what I want, but you know, they're the most shreddy twingy guitars you could ever play. Absolutely. Uh, do you, what about uh, acoustics? Oh, well, out of the electrics, you, you mentioned you're some of your Gibsons you keep there. Do you have one that's your favorite? Um, I would say my Gibson Explorer playing wise, um, it was the first Gibson I ever owned. Um, I got it when I was like 15 from my parents for Christmas. Um, and I, I toured with that guitar relentlessly. It's seen hundreds of hundreds of shows, but it's still, no matter what weather I go through, it always acclimates and it comes back to just perfect action, perfect intonation. And it sounds so killer. Any chance you know what year it is or? I think it's an 04. Okay. Oh, so it's a, fairly new. Yeah, they they're yeah. really they're really um the, the, they're dependable fucking guitars and they're just fucking beautiful too. So, love the body. Oh, yeah. It's the that's when I was like learning how to play all the Metallica stuff. I was like I need a Gibson Explorer. <laughs> so my mom bought me a nice black one with silver pickups and mm. all the all the bells and whistles. It was, it's a badass guitar. Do you have a favorite color you like your guitar to be? <laughs> you know what? I don't. I usually just go with black. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, that counts. Sorry. I would like a red one, like a cherry red flying bee, um, or maybe even a white one. But okay, I always stick with black. I always yeah. stick with black. Well, it's a very classic and sleek looking. It's it's the only way I go any nowadays. But I don't really. In, I'm not in the market for too many new guitars. When I do, it's kind of a luxury. But uh, um, yeah. Uh, what about acoustic? Do you mess around with those at all? Yeah, I have a few. I have uh, two of the Midas acoustics. Um, one's a 12 string, one's just a regular one. Um, but when I was growing up, my stepdad had Martins, and 
I fell in love with Martins. I'll play a Martin over a Taylor or a Gibson any day. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with a Martin guitar. Um, oh, yeah. It feels like you're driving like a big old honky tow truck. <laughs> and then when you're, when you're driving, you know, when you're playing a Taylor, it feels like you're in like a sports car. That's a good way to describe there's it. Definitely, there's definitely a big difference. Mm -hmm. And tone, too, just... Uh... Um, yeah, they've, they've, they've done better with making cheap acoustics like that sound decent and play well, but you still, there's a, a, a lion's, I don't know. There's just a mountain of difference between, you know, some of the lower end stuff and the high end, but anyway. Yeah. You can tell the difference. Like even a brand new Gibson, that's really expensive. It sounds like it's in like a, it sounds like it's held back until that it really like acclimates and opens up and mm -hmm. it's get played, it get played a lot. Um, but it just sounds like almost tinny and plastic. It's weird. You have to play it for like four years for it to really open up and be warm. My parents, you mentioned your mom was nice enough to buy you an Explorer. Uh, when I got, Kiss was the band that got me into it and they got me an acoustic and I just looked at them like, what the fuck you expect me to do with that? You know, I just, uh, and then, yeah. at the time I was young, you know, but I wanted to rock. I wanted, to, you see this picture. That's what I want. I don't know what this is. This is, this is what you see on Hee Haw. You know, so I don't know. yeah, <laughs> I have more now. But uh, anyway, um, what? Give me a rundown of the rest of your gear. I, I'm fascinated because, like I said, I'm, we're gonna get into the the music, and and to me, one of the, the things that sticks out is is your guitar tone, and uh, it's kind of cool to kind of break it all down for some of the people that are more into this kind of stuff. Yeah, so I played straight through a JCM 800. Mm, that's the best. Um, I play on the high setting, and then I have a few pedals. Um, I have two fuzz pedals. I have an overdrive. Um, the fuzz pedals I have is the Red Witch Fuzz God and the Evil Fuzz. Um, and then, oh, I actually have the Plasma pedal by Game Changer Audio, which is a killer pedal. Um, I put that through an octave pedal. I have a wall. I have the Flint Strymon. And that is a tremolo and reverb pedal. And I always keep the reverb on just for a little bit extra tone. And then I have a tuner and a sound suppressor. So it's really just, it's mostly wah and fuzz and distortion and reverb. I don't mess with anything else really. No, no delays, nothing like that. I'm just like, what you get is what you get. How much do you play a day? Do you, is this something you have to like uh, keep going on or do you like take days off when you're not touring? Um, I usually play guitar every day, even if it's like for 15 minutes or if it's for an hour. Um, I've been so busy with work recently. It's just been like, you know, 15, 20 minutes a day, just plucking and keeping my chops up. But when I'm in it, in it, and I'm like dedicated to learning, I can play anywhere from four to eight hours a day. Hmm. Now I kind of intimated you're a bit of an old soul. I want to pull this out. Um, uh, your guys is a uh, rolling stoned album. Now, for anybody that hasn't bought this, you, well, I don't know if it, even know if it's still available on vinyl, but uh, you kind of have like the, you know, everything looks like it's worn and old, you know, it's kind of give, giving you that uh, kind of, like it's been in a record rack a long time. It, it's got the, the ring and stuff like that. Um, I'm yeah. guessing you've rolled a, a, your share of joints off vinyl, off an album cover. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Especially on tour. David and I have <laughs> rolled plenty of joints. Yeah. Uh, now, now, did you? I don't know if you know this trick, but you, the, the gate fold works better. Uh, then you can just kind of like fold it up, and all the the weed that didn't get into the the, the joint just kind of rolls down. And oh, it, and you can it, like funnel it into yeah, the joint. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm gonna try that next. All time. right. I'm glad I got to help out. Oh man. Um, well, the new song "Burner." You know, it's perfectly titled because it's a fucking burner, man. Um, well, let's talk about that a little bit. I want to get into some of the other things you guys have been releasing since you know the last since this EP came out. Um, but just a great. I mean, there's so many things about this song. First of all, it's, it, there's hooks throughout the whole thing. You're again back to your your playing, just riff heavy. That's why I think kind of I owe me. These are you have very melodic, catchy riffs, but they're hard rock and kind of metal sounding, so they really pull you in. And and then well, the video is fun as hell, but that, not surprised by that. But the uh, everything about this is just I don't know. It seems like the last three songs you guys have released, or at least the, the last three that I'm going to talk about. It just everything from from the two EPs you released before this one, the the Rolling Stone EP, which has some of that stuff on it, and then of course these last few songs. Your trajectory is going the right direction, Jordan. Yeah, I believe so. Um, when we released Burner, and at least when we wrote it, I was like, "This is 
this is like the music that I love and I kind of grew up on, you know, like the Judas Priest and the Metallica and the heavy stuff, but, you know, cause it's kind of a thrashy riff and a it's little bit. very high paced and it's drivey and it's just like, doo -doo -gaka, doo -doo -gaka, doo. It, you know, it's just, and then when the riff comes in, it just punches you in the face and there's a ripping guitar solo. Um, the chorus is very drivey. There's a pre-chorus. It's just kind of an all over the place song in the right way. Um, and it's melodic. It's not too stabby. It's not like, you know, a Bon Scott lyric. There's actually like, you know, there's melody and there's harmonies. Like you've listened to Alice in Chains. Um, I think we did really well with the song. Um, looking back on it, um, when I hear the master, I don't, I like, no, nah, I don't think I'd change anything. And most of the time when you hear a song back, you're like, oh, I wish I would have done this in the studio or I wish I had done this because we don't have the luxury of just like going back and changing the song. You know, we're not Kanye West or the Food Fighters where we could, you know, we have the money to do that. It's like what you get is what you get. So you got to make sure that you do it right. Um, and Burner is just one of those songs where everything just was right. Everything was right. Like even where you're going to crash tonight. Mm. It was just like it was it was it was right and it hits you right in the face. When uh, so how how much would you actually once the songs are written, if you want to be that prepared, I assume you want to be in the studios as short as possible. Like how how much like time do you guys rehearse these things before you go in? So we pretty much get like the the main gist of the song. Um, like I I pretty much know the song when I'm going in, and then I kind of show the guys, you know, what to do, what to play, what dynamics to add, and they'll come up with their own stuff in the studio. And then the producer will be like, oh, no, do this here, do that there. Um, so, I mean, the song is pretty much 95% done before we go record, and then we just we kind of change it around a little bit um, as far as dynamics or structure or even, like, vocals or melodies. Um but yeah, I mean, we're pretty well rehearsed before we go into the studio because we don't want to waste anyone's time nor mm -hmm. nor our own. Um, how many days are we talking? A couple of days or? Um, for that song, I mean, we probably recorded that sucker in two days. We did all the instruments in one day and then vocals the next. Right, uh, it turned out great. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned where you're going to crash tonight. Um, that, I was going to bring that one up as well as uh, pour out pour out another one. Again, I think these these songs take the band kind of. It's good to see a band that, um, well, that I was fortunate enough to kind of you know hear it a little bit more in the infancy phase phase where your music is definitely progressing. You know, you can kind of hear everything from the songwriting to the performance to the production. You know what I mean? And and it's fun for someone like me, especially who's been listening to music and doing whatever other stuff for forty years, to still kind of get that 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 burn you know what i mean to like god this is really cool and kind of you know get into a band you know it, it's it, it's it's just it's it's ideal i guess but yeah yeah i mean our sound is definitely changing um like i said when, when we first started we kind of wanted to be like a black sabbath kind of just stoner rock um acdc classic rock band and then we were like you know what this is being done this has been done already you know we're not gonna ever get famous or sell out stadiums if we're playing fucking acdc songs like it's already been done um and then few other bands have done it like jet i mean you know greta van fleet's doing led zeppelin even though they're playing stadiums but it's just like i didn't want to be one of those cover bands or bands that were just taking other band songs and just ripping them off um i just wanted to you know, take music that inspired me and just kind of go off that and be like, this is what I want to hear. This is what I want my band to sound like. Um, I don't, I'm not really into just kind of ripping someone off or sounding like anyone or trying to be the next Queens of the Stone Age or trying to be the next, you know, Humble Pie or Aerosmith. Well, I think that's what's encouraging about the the music you've been putting out is that it definitely leans on everything that's out there that, that uh, the influences and things of that nature, but it does seem like it's presented in a way that's moving forward instead of just kind of like trying to be a mirror of something. You, everybody has their influences. You, you know, you, you mentioned many of them already so far, but your music sounds like you. And that's really, I think, I don't know, one of the biggest compliments I can give to somebody. Yeah. I appreciate that, man. I mean, that's what we strive for. We don't really want to sound like anyone else and, that's the only, you don't want to be a cover band or, you know, be a tribute band. We just want to, we want to be them evils. Okay. Uh, well, something happened. Oh, I think, Rami, there yeah, we go. There we go. All right. 
Um, well, let's uh, now. So you got a handful of songs out there right now. Is there things are changing the way these things are? So I'm not even sure if this is even like something you guys are trying to do. But are we going to get like a physical product, more vinyl, maybe an album at some point, or uh, is the plan right now to just kind of keep putting out music and and working? Um, right now, until we get another label, um, it's just singles. Okay. Um, we could release an album, but I don't think people's attention spans are that long. They would just listen <laughs> to the album for a few weeks, drop it, and then wait for another four years, forget about us until we release another album. All right. So we can just release singles every you know six to eight weeks, and then we'll stay relevant. We'll stay you know constantly in their brain, and they're always thinking about us. And they're like, oh, I wonder when them evil is coming out with another song. Well, I guess in another six to eight weeks. All right, you know, right. they don't have to wait another year to two years for us to drop a whole entire album. So you, you don't see a, a, well, like you said, you mentioned maybe with a label, but a scenario where you end up like having eight to 10 singles out where you say, yeah, we're just going to package this and do something or. So wait, say that again. They're like, maybe like once you do get like eight to 10 singles out there, any chance that you would do something like a, like a physical, like a, I mean, I'm more going more towards vinyl. That's always the fun thing to look to get nowadays, but. I mean, yeah, that's that's kind of like the goal. So we would release a whole bunch of singles, eventually just put it on an album, you know, come up with an album concept um, and then release that, especially when we go on tour, because it'd be something for the fans to have mm -hmm. and something we could sell. Um, but right now, with not a lot of touring going on, it's just, you know, the streams on Spotify and all that bullshit matters when it comes to like yeah Met of record labels and management and all that they just want that stream which is the first 30 seconds of a song so you got to make the first 30 seconds the best part of the song it's just so much bullshit yeah <laughs> don't get me going on it um i do you know I, i'm a bit of a I, I like vinyl i collect it all that stuff i know it's popular and all, all things but uh you, you're a, you're a smaller you know independent kind of level band i gotta tell you the vinyl whoever mastered it spot on uh the the ep that yeah. rolling stone it thing sounds fucking amazing i i, I like literally bought Ted it with the Jensen idea because i got one. a i got a t-shirt with it and i was like yeah fuck them give them some money and i got a cool record but i was like this sounds spot on yeah kato produced that master or mixed it and then i, I believe ted jensen God. mastered that the um the, he's like he's the guy to send everything to he's he's done like back in black and all that stuff I don't know if you know, but it's a little hit and miss with new releases, even with bigger artists, man. So, yeah, it kudos is. Kudos to him. But yeah, uh, your your bass player Jake was in the um, uh, running to be the bass player for Steel Panther. I didn't actually hear who won. I assume it wasn't him. Uh, I know he advanced pr pretty well. Was there any worry that like what, like was he not going to be in them evils if if that happened or? No, we would still do our thing. And if okay. we needed a replacement guitar player or a bass player when he was on the road with Steel Panther or any other band, you know, it's not it's not a big deal. We're all just here just trying to make it and do it our own way and do it together. But, you know, we, we support that kind of stuff. Like if I go off and play with another band for a few weeks okay. or go record with another artist, they don't they don't make us think about it. You know, we're we're just all trying to, you know, make it and be better musicians and you know, we got to look out for ourselves too, just as much as we do our band. And right. we got to have experiences. We can't just be loyal to one band. It's not like a monogamous, monogamous relationship. Like Dave Grohl, you know, he was in Foo Fighters and then he was doing Queens of the Stone Age and then he did them crooked vultures. It's like, you know, you got to go out and experience and live and learn and, you know, create other music and have other outlets. You, you, since you brought him up, obviously you've heard about the passing of Taylor Hawkins. <laughs> That was pretty shocking, obviously. It um, and it's you know, probably the biggest news in music right now. I uh, I don't suppose there's any chance that you guys ever had a chance to cross paths with the Foo Fighters. I do know you played a ton of festivals, so maybe. Yeah, we actually have. Um, we won this battle of bands one time. You know, we played Lost Highway Festival in San Bernardino, California. Um, and then Taylor Hawkins was actually hanging out. And playing with like fog hat and he was you know in his little toyota truck wow. or whatever truck he had he thought he'd be driving like his fancy sports car but he had this old beat up <laughs> small pickup truck um we exchanged a few words with him he was cool but i remember we were playing i think it was rock on the range 
and uh, we were actually just hanging out and messing with the Foo Fighters. It was mostly Dave Grohl. Uh, Josh Homme was there too. Uh, and we just got, we were there at the right time where they were backstage and we, you know, we went up and introduced ourselves and we took some pictures with them and just chatted with them for a little bit. And Dave Grohl gave us a whole case of beer. Um, <laughs> what kind of beer? Of IPAs. Oh. It was a whole bunch of like IPAs okay. and pale ales that they didn't want. Yeah. You know, he's a um, Coors Light guy. <laughs> so, is he really? Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I didn't I, know that. I only but, know that um, from seeing him explain it. Uh, we, we weren't hanging out, uh, shotgunning them together or anything like that. But no. Oh, yeah. But yeah, my experience with them—they were really nice, humble <laughs> dudes. You know, they just really love music, and they just—I think they really support the the struggle and how it's how it's how you know, like a small band goes through it and the touring and all the bullshit that they have to go through before you start playing stadiums and arenas. And just the drama, the, you know, the, the cost of gas and all the yeah, fucking yeah. hardships that you go through on tour. It's not, it's not a glorious life. You know, people think being in a rock band and being a rock star is, you know, limos and hot chicks and steaks and lobster after your shows. But it's fucking hard boiled eggs, salami, sleeping in your RV, <laughs> but you know, it's the best thing ever. It's that it's worth that 45 minutes on stage. Shotgun it really is. Uh, Shmirin off ices. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's definitely not champagne and caviar. It's white claws <laughs> and salami. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I forgot that little story was actually predated white claw. Um, that's why I was a little confused, but, uh, well, it's, you've uh, let's talk about live. Uh, any what's uh, what have you been doing recently? I know you did a short run, like you mentioned, going through Texas. Uh, anything coming up? Any kind of stuff we uh, look forward to seeing them evils out there? Well, we haven't announced anything yet, and it's not approved, so I can't say exactly oh, what come we're on. doing. I could really use the scoop, Jordan. I could really use the scoop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to promise anyone because okay. if, if it doesn't get if it doesn't get approved, then I I'll sound like an idiot. But yeah, I, um, know. I know we have some Vegas shows coming up. We have a Wayfair show coming up, um, and like I said, we got some tour stuff coming up. But I can't tell you the dates or who with. So just, I guess you got to stay tuned. Uh, yeah, and the internet's out there, so we'll find out pretty much when it's official. Oh but... yeah, you'll you guys will find out just as fast as we will. <laughs> okay, uh, I I will add uh, mention. Um, one of the things that I don't miss uh, when, when, when I was trying to, to, to do what you're doing um, is the whole day of the show was such a, you know, basically just waiting to play. And um, it, it was a balance of learning how to not like chemically make yourself unavailable. But there are there were certain tricks that I started to lean on just to kill time. Was there anything you like to do basically to like basically fill in seven hours that you're waiting or however long, you know what I mean? Where you're sitting in a parking lot of a place you're not gonna play for another eight hours, whatever. Yeah, I mean I just read books, look at my phone, play guitar, um, call my fiance. I go about the town, you know, looking, discovering, and you know, about an hour and a half before we play, I go back in the RV, I start warming up, I start playing guitar, I start going over the set, writing the set list and going over what we did yesterday, what we can improve or, oh, you know, you, you did that. That was awesome. Keep doing that. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's mostly just warming up and thinking about the show and getting myself pumped up. It's not, there's not too much drinking or partying that goes on anymore. Uh, we used to do that all the time, but now I'm just so in it. I'm so in it to win it. We've been doing it for a long time. And it's like, all right, this is the time to, you know, start being serious about it. Um, so, yeah, it's just mostly pumping myself up, getting in a great mental space, spot, or space, sorry. And um, I'm just getting ready to get after it. What about powering through, like, the, the quirks of the three of you being in a small space for a couple of weeks? Um, I mean... Like I said, I'll just, if they're pissing me off or <laughs> drinking or doing something stupid, I'll just leave the RV and go, you know, hang out at a Starbucks and look at my laptop and just do stuff there, or go exploring, go to a museum or see all the vintage shops and buy records and all that stuff. So, all right, fair enough. Uh, well, before I let you go, uh, why don't you, what are you, what are you currently listening to as far as like new music, new bands? What are you into right now? New bands. I haven't really found a lot of new bands, but I'm listening to, I'm always listening to Metallica and Pantera. Um, 
I'm always listening to Alice in Chains. I've been listening to just the same old stuff, but it's stuff that I love and really inspires me. Um, you know, Royal Blood, Rival Sons. Um, I really love this new like rock and roll blues band called The Record Company. Hmm. Uh, um, they're pretty bitching. And since Taylor Hawkins died, I've been just, you know, obviously listening to a lot of Foo Fighters. Um, I didn't really realize how freaking great they were. They're so amazing. Dave Grohl can write a damn song. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. Um, we do a show that we just wrapped up every every March. It's called March Badness. And what we do is we basically put up a bracket and we let our listeners vote on it. And um, and it's all these records about artists that we like and love, but this record sucks. Uh, is there an artist, uh, like, let me give you Metallica Lulu would be an example of kind of what we're talking about. We're all big Metallica fans, but that one was kind of a turd. Is there a record by a band that you love that you would like to nominate for March Badness maybe in next year? Ooh. I would either go Dirt. Alice in Chains or Core by Stone Devil Pilots. Dirt? You don't like Dirt? Oh, you're saying band or yeah, oh, yeah. that it's I a, don't like? Yes, a bad record from a band you love. I'm sorry if I didn't explain that well. Ooh, a bad record from an album or an artist that I love. Uh, it's probably St. Anger okay. from Metallica. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that one's already been the uh, the, 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 the victor, uh, so... Uh, that was an easy one, but I gotta tell you, Dirt. Yeah, uh, I did a I did a top fifty grunge countdown. I for my personal list, Dirt was number one. Um, I, oh, Dirt is the best '90s album ever made. Like you can't get better than Dirt. Yeah, no. Dirt and like I would say, Bad Motor Finger. Yeah, God, I still you put know, Dirt like, over it, but yeah, I had they they were both in my top oh, four. For sure. So, but anyway, every song on Dirt is just uh. uh is a burner it's like they're all so good there's not one bad song on that album my only complaint was i didn't think they should have let they put wood on it it's a great song but it was on a the soundtrack and it seemed it felt like a record company decision like let's just shove this on the end because it's a hit uh you know what the, the, i i realized something with the original pressing of that uh cd the organization on the songs were different. I think Down in the Hole wasn't number four. It was it was actually like number six or the last song on the album and Wood was before it. Okay. And then I I bought like a, a new pressing of the album and Down in the Hole is number four and Wood is that last song. Yeah. Um, it fits so better at number four? I, I, I guess. I Same guess scene. Down in the Hole fits better at number four because you have this assault of just like, you know, them bones what is it rain when i die or them bones down that river rain when i die and then it hits into down in a hole yeah but i think their original pressing and their original release it was organized different wow you go deep that that is a nerd you can oh. host your own podcast with that kind of level of knowledge George. oh dude i'm an alice in chains nerd dude that's my favorite band i, I listen to them every day uh jerry's on tour right now do you like his uh uh record he just released i actually haven't listened to it i've been meaning to um, can't find it anywhere assuming, other than streaming but i'm assuming it just you know it sounds like the newer alice in chance without william Duvall. yeah that's that's probably fair I'm, it's a little lighter that's what it's like yeah his like boggy depot stuff and uh the you know the jerry cantrell just that project mm -hmm. um you know, it was very Alice in Chains. I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of those songs were made for Alice in Chains, but he just never got to finish them with Lane. Yeah. All right. Oh, well, Jordan, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciated it. Uh, we, we, um, we've talked about you quite a bit on our podcast, basically since inception. Well, basically since I got to, to meet you guys and, and hear your, your music. Uh, really encourage anybody listening, check out the, the, the new stuff. Bur start with Burner, work your way back. You're, you're not going to be disappointed. Um, and I don't know if there's anything else you want to promote, talk about. Now's your chance, buddy. Yeah, check us out, themevils.com. Um, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, at themevils. Um, check out Burner, go on YouTube, listen to all of our songs. Uh, we got a lot of killer music videos out there. Um, I want to give a shout out to Jim Kaufman, Eric German, and Justin Brunner for helping us with everything. And um, we also have this new shirt. It's the Burner um, it's the burner single shirt, um, and they've been selling like hotcakes on the internet and on tour. So make sure you go pick one of those up. It's a limited release. 
hopefully we'll print more when they sell out. Uh, we got a few left, but definitely check out our online store. Get some albums, get some signed stuff. We have drum heads, we have signed symbols. You know, we, we've got it all. So if you want any merch, definitely check it out. Yeah, absolutely. And, you, and people, you're helping out musicians that keep making great music. So you mentioned the shirt. There was that kind of designer shirt you guys did a few months back. Uh, shit, I'm sorry. I don't have the name. Do you remember what I'm talking about? It was kind of a... Um... It, it was like the Legends and Devils one. Yes, it looked like yes. heavy, like death metal. Yeah. That thing was sick, man. Are those still available? <laughs> I think you could find it. Uh, there's a link in our Instagram bio, um, like in our link tree. You can um, definitely click on that and go buy it. It's it's print to order, though, so you might have to wait okay. a little bit. Um, if you went on our website and just ordered a shirt, we ship them out ourselves, and it'd be shipped out next day. Right on. Uh, well, there you have it. Uh, once again, Jordan, always good to talk to you. Thank you again for coming back on uh, Cobras and Fire. And Well, enjoy the weather. It looks like it's nice out where you're at. So. Oh, yeah. Great weather. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate having me. Bye-bye. See you next time.